Hello and welcome to Football Digest, the final edition of the Women's World Cup episodes. Um, I am joined by Jack, who is in his final hours out in Sydney at the moment, and also joined by Hannah and Beth. You will be joining us on the day after England lost the Women's World Cup on Sunday. They fell to a 1-0 defeat against Spain. Um, I think it's a mix of emotions this morning. I know definitely for me in the whirlwind yesterday when we were um, on the day of recording, it's Monday. So on, on Sunday when, when we were cover, covering it all and in the madness, it was a bit of a whirlwind. And this morning waking up, you kind of see everything. You see all the posts, you see all the... Um, the responses and the reactions from all the team and Serena Beekman and it really puts into perspective how much this team has achieved over the last four weeks um, and every team that's gone out there this Women's World Cup has been the biggest that there's ever been it was the first time that there was 32 teams in the tournament and I think every single nation that's been out there they've played their heart and soul into that football have done every single person proud. Um, Jack, what was it like yesterday? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's difficult to know where to start. Really, I mean, first and foremost, it was. I think, as I said the other day after the semi final, it was a, a privilege, of course, to be able to be in in the stadium with England in a World Cup final. And both both pre and post game, I sort of had to take a moment and just say, God, yeah, I don't know when this will next come round again. Who? How do any of us know when if it's a once in a generation thing? Hopefully, it's not with this team because there's there's still so much potential there, and that I don't think as long as Serena Vigman's in in place, I, I don't think they'll be going anywhere from sort of competing for for tournaments at the business end. Which uh, obviously, as as we know, things things always weren't like that for for the women's side. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully we'll be back one day. But it was yeah, it was it was an amazing experience. I thought it was a, a really good final. You know, an, an open game, or as open as you could hope a final to be. Two sides have improved throughout the tournament, and and probably certainly in Spain's case, I think gave their best performance of the tournament. So, yeah, it was it was a privilege to be there. Disappointing from an England perspective that that, that they just came up short, but I think certainly for for players and and not just footballers, you know, whatever whatever. whatever of life we're in you, as long as you can look yourself in the mirror and say you gave it absolutely everything then you can't have too many complaints and I think those those England players yesterday although <laughs> there were technical things that that weren't that, that they weren't always at the, the top of their game if you like but I think yeah for, for effort and will to win and and commitment to the cause that none of them can be faulted that they, they gave it absolutely everything and left it all out there on the pitch so so what more can you ask for yeah, absolutely. And they really did give everything. They they put their heart and souls in performance that, that they gave. And you could see by the end of it, Hannah, they were just absolutely devastated, weren't they? I mean, every interview that they've given, they've they've always talked about how much resilience that they've got and how they've conquered every battle. And it was just, it was one hurdle a little bit too far. Um, I don't know about you, but it, it broke my heart seeing them so upset and I think what set me off was actually Mary Earps just uncontrollably sobbing and having having some of the the rest of the team around her um this is going to take a while isn't it Hannah to kind of get over a little bit and and kind of get back on it always would I mean you know you're potentially one goal away from obviously taking it to extra time and and it it's probably just more the fact that it, it was in touch and distance. I mean, when you exit a tournament a little bit earlier, it's disappointing. But at the same time, when you are that close and it's quite literally within your grasp um, and for it not to quite come off, it's just absolutely heartbreaking. And I think it's it's hard for us to watch as fans because I think as a nation, you know, we've absolutely fallen in love with this team and this manager. And, and there's so many that, you know, we love them as people, not just players, and and just to see them upset, it, it does make you upset. But you know, if there is one thing that that we have learned about this team, um, 
especially under Serena Wiegmann, it is they are resilient and obviously they weren't quite able to get over the line um yesterday, but the hunger will will still be there. You know, that that's the one thing that won't go anywhere and that any defeat won't take that away. And if anything, it'll probably make them more hungry to to go out, hopefully qualify for the Olympics next year. That there, there is another Euros around the corner. They'll no doubt want to retain that title as well. So that's probably the one good thing about football is for every knockback, you know, there's plenty of other games around the corner that almost don't make you forget about it, but there's already something else to be focusing on that, you know, you, you can almost sort of take your mind away from from that setback and, the, and then use it to fuel, hopefully, um, more success in the future. So, yeah, it, it's, it's one of those things where it will sting in, in the moment and it will probably sting for a little while, but... Um, yeah, that, that I have no doubt in my mind that, that they'll bounce back and even more so under a manager like Serena Wiegmann. And I think that's the thing. They are going to bounce back. They will bounce back. They just have to feel all of those emotions that they're going to be feeling right now. The highs and the lows are going to be reflecting over so much. But what these women have done for so many people, not just little girls, but for little boys as well, for women, for generations, for for you know older women for absolutely anybody beth they've created something so special in their legacy they have just made everybody realize that you can reach for the stars and all your hopes and dreams will come true and i think they they know that as well don't they and i think that's something really special about them that as well that they're so humble about it but talk talk us through beth about kind of where where we see things going next obviously we've got the wsl season coming up the championship also starts literally this week and talk us through that what their legacy is going to leave now yeah I, th I think it's a it's a really sort of fine line between obviously what they have achieved and, and the legacy that they've left as you said is incredible but equally this is an incredible group of athletes who are at the absolute peak of the powers and and want to win every single game and I, I think to an extent we have to be careful sometimes in sort of maybe downplaying the, the impact of this defeat and how much it will hurt simply because of what they've done off the pitch and and that's to do them and the women's game in general a great disservice really because ultimately they are athletes and, and they want to win and, and they will be they will be hurting but yeah as you said it it's what they've achieved you know off the pitch is is incredible and, and we can't we can't deny that I mean I wrote a piece yesterday for the mirror about you know when we look back at the the Euros final in 2009 which which England lost to, to Germany um, and, and that England squad were, were heading back to the UK Hope Powell who was manager at the time made all of the players wear suits because she thought that the um she thought that the airport would be full of, of media and, and fans potentially greeting them back after, you know, making it to a Euros final. And, and they, that squad touched down back in the UK. They walked through the airport and there wasn't a single person there to greet them. Now, if you can compare that to today, where, where England squads are travelling back from Sydney and they've been walking through the Sydney airport earlier today and, and members of the public have been stood applauding them as they've walked past. And I think that is a perfect sort of example of of what this team have done and how they've completely helped transform the way the women's game is perceived, not just in the UK, but across the world. And that is huge. And, and the legacy that they leave will endure far beyond this tournament. And, um, you know, I think there's obviously things that now need to be resolved. You know, that that dispute with the FA over bonuses for this tournament, that was obviously postponed for the duration of the World Cup, that will surely be revisited now. I know sort of the Let Girls Play campaign where, where the government have pledged to provide equal access to, to girls and boys in school, which is obviously something that the Lioness has campaigned for after the Euros. That's something that, you know, the government now need to really make good on that and ensure that that does come to fruition fairly quickly. But this is a, a group of players who have worked tirelessly to try and, you know, transform the women's game in this country. And, you know, I think even just the small things like seeing you know, little girls and little boys walking around in England kits these last few days and being just genuinely just so excited to watch this team and not thinking, oh, it's, it's women's football, it, it's England in a World Cup final. And I think you can't you can't underestimate the, the, the power of that and the impact of that. So, yeah, you know, these girls will be will be disappointed and they will have to take some time to regroup and, and go again. But I think when they look back on this tournament, they'll see it as another example of them really cementing that legacy and helping to, to really boost the profile of the women's game. 
don't think I could have put it more beautifully myself. <laughs> um, you really hit the nail on the head. There are so many positives. And, you know, we everybody's kind of talking about, you know, oh, it's it's really sad and it's really disappointing and it's devastating that we, we didn't quite get there and we settled for second place. <clears throat> but there's no settling about it. We really have done something amazing. These women have done something amazing. And, and Beth, you spoke there about, you know, little girls and little boys and adults as well are walking around in these kits with names on the backs of their shirts. Um, before we go any further, I do want to obviously talk about Mary Earps. Um, she is the tournament's Golden Glove winner, which is so richly deserved. Um, I don't think there was anybody better suited for that. She has put in such a phenomenal performance across the entire tournament. I think as well, it's fair to say, and I don't know whether you guys will agree, but probably saved us from getting knocked out a little bit earlier on in the tournament as well. She's put in some absolutely incredible performances and has won that that Golden Glove. Um, and obviously, before the tournament even started, before a ball was even kicked on the pitch, there was this row ongoing about Nike not even going close to manufacturing any goalkeeper shirts from not just Marriott's, but her goalkeeping union across the, the nations. Um, there's obviously backlash for that. It just keeps on going because oh, surely they, that's the least, the minimum that they deserve. Um, for those that don't know, I'm just going to read out a statement from Nike um, following Mary Earp's incredible performance because after that incredible save yesterday, that conversation continued. So Nike has said, Nike is committed to women's football and we're excited by the passion around this year's tournament and the incredible win by the Lionesses to make it into the final. We are proudly offering the best of Nike innovation and services to our Federation partners and hundreds of athletes. They continue by saying, we hear and understand the desire for a retail version of a goalkeeper jersey and we are working towards solutions for future tournaments in partnership with both FIFA and the federations. The fact that there's a conversation on this topic is a testament to the continued passion and energy around the women's game and we believe that's encouraging. Um, Jack, on that statement, the fact that Nike have turned around and said, we hear it, but we're still not going to do anything about it just yet, is a serious insult to not just Mary Earps for the Lionesses, but also other athletes who are missing those goalkeeper shirts. She's come out and said how disappointed she was before that all of her family couldn't even get her, her name on the back of their shirts for a goalkeeper kit. What do you think is next for this now? I mean, it's it's hard to say what's next. I, I just think that's a it's such a weak statement, and it's five five weeks too late minimum anyway. To put that out now just reeks of sort of reacting to to a pile, you know, a, a social media backlash, uh, a wider public backlash, and it's yeah, it's pretty embarrassing from from their point of view. I mean, I, I was in the room that that day when when Mary Earps decided to speak about speak about the the lack of availability of the shirts and she, she you could just tell how you know she she was she was genuinely so hurt by this and also her fight after you know after going into detail on on sort of the steps she's taken that she's had meetings with nike she's you know she's really tried to push this herself the, the most you know the final sort of parting comment from her that day was that she'd had no promises about that it would even be looked back into in the future there was no, there was no prospect of them revisiting this issue so it's, it's clearly just a yeah it's a it's sort of a pathetic late change of not even a, like you say not even a promise to change their approach really it's just it's awful from that and, and and it's it's not it's just naive from them i think that that they're they're saying it's a commercial decision but you just need to look at the reaction to Mary Earp's performance yesterday. I, th I think the difference as well is, and I'm not saying it's it's right that other um, countries don't sell the women's goalkeeper shirt as well, who also have Nike produce their kits or teams with other 
uh, manufacturers and also don't have the kits. But I think the difference with Mary Epps is she's so clearly a, a global star. And, you know, personally, I, I'm not on TikTok, but you don't need to be on TikTok to know what a, what an impact she has on there. The way she connects with fans on there, it's, it's everyone knows about it in women's football and beyond women's football. So they're just, the, it's, it's such a, a poor, you know, they're just missing such a trick. And I think that's why it's it's worse for her, and it's worse for and it's worse as well for England that um, England are meant to be leading the game when it comes to women's football. You know, we've got one of the best domestic leagues in the world. Now we've got one of the best international teams in the world. Players that are that are becoming genuine superstars beyond football. England need to need to help as much and, and put pressure on Nike as much as it's because it shouldn't be just down to just Mary Earps as an individual. It should be down to to, to the FA and, and England. I think and yeah week from there but hopefully hopefully it, it changes in the coming months but personally I, I can't see any prospect of it at the moment yeah I really hope it changes I mean for me she was it was it was tough because I think so many players just played their hearts out this tournament but she's probably my player of the tournament um and I'll I'll quickly actually throw throw that one out to the room on who who your guys player of the tournament was for the Lionesses um, Hannah, I'm going to start with you. I'm putting putting you all on the spot a little bit here, but um, I think there's a lot to choose from. But yeah, who who do you think your player of the tournament was across the board? Um, well, we, we wrote it in our in some pieces um, the other day going into the final, and and I said then Alex Greenwood, and I I stand by that. Um, even you seeing yesterday having to be bandaged up and then coming back up like that is just she is an absolute warrior that woman I love her to pieces um so yeah f for me it's Alex Greenwood um I think she's probably been one of England's most I mean don't get me wrong we've had a fair few consistent performers throughout this tournament a huge shout out for Jess Carter as well I think she's been outstanding sort of especially as well with that back line at the beginning of the tournament getting moved around a bit as Serena sort of found out what what worked best but yeah um Alex Greenwood without a shadow of a doubt um she's been outstanding and yeah hope, hopefully that's going to continue into the Nations League and, and beyond as well. Any agreements for Alex Greenwood? Yeah I'm, I'm gonna go for, for Alex Greenwood as well obviously Bootle's finest isn't she so I've got to back her being from Merseyside but um yeah no bi bias aside she's been absolutely exceptional and I think when you consider she was obviously she had a completely different role at the Euros last summer she was a was a sub she came on I think she came on in five games but all of those appearances were, were from the bench and her job was very much about sort of seeing the game out when when the game was already won really at the Euros and, and now she's had to sort of take on the mantle of of plugging the void left by Leah Williamson, hasn't she? And she's done that phenomenally well. Uh, Jess Carter also. I think, to be honest, England's whole whole back line, really, that's where they've been the strongest at, the, at this tournament. Um, but, you know, also special mention for, for Lauren Hemp, because I think certainly in, in, attacking, in, attacking sense, in, an, in an attacking sense, she's been England's brightest performer. I think even yesterday when England struggled offensively and didn't create too much, obviously Lauren Hemp had sort of the moment of the first half, didn't she, when she... She hit the bar for England and, you know, how agonisingly close she was to giving England the lead there. But, um, but yeah, so Alex Green won for me, but, but Lauren Hemp has also been exceptional. Jack, where are you uh, heading with this one? I'm going to have to be boring as well and, and also say Alex Greenwood um, to give no debate. I mean, I've, I've selected my, my team of the tournament this afternoon and I went for the, the two England players that made my overall team were Mary Earps and Alex Greenwood. So I suppose I'm naturally I'd be between those two, and I think for yeah, just for like Beth said, not not only the fact she's come back into the team, having she not not many people would have had her as a starter potentially if Leah Williamson was fit, but also she's played different positions in each in the first three games. She played a different position each time. That's not that's not easy to do, particularly at a World Cup. That's 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 testament to her, I think, as a as a professional and as a utility player. And yeah, she's. She's in the form of her life now, and it's going to be hard to hard to see her getting dropped. So yeah, I'd I'd back her um, for England's player tournament. Also, just to add on with, but also Jess Carter deserves to mention because yeah, she she's another one as well. She wouldn't have no one had her starting, you know, four or five months ago if they were picking their England team, and she's she's gone on to be one of the most dependable performers, and was dropped for the second game against Denmark. And and she said to me last week, just a, a few days, a couple of days before the finals, she said, told me that she didn't even expect to be a starter at this tournament. So for her, dropping back down to the bench against Denmark, 
wasn't even a shock. She said, I wasn't even surprised. I expected Serena told me what my role would be, and that's what I expected. Fast forward a few weeks later, and she's playing in a World Cup final. So, uh, yeah, those that they all deserve special praise. I'm very intrigued now. Who is talk to us about your your team of the tournament, then, Jack? Yeah, so it's it's available. I mean, it's available to read on the mirror for everyone to tell me why why I'm wrong. Um, which I'm I'm sure you you can all do it for a start in the, in the team, let alone uh, anyone else. But yeah, I've I, it, it's difficult selecting an eleven just because there's been so many different formations and tactical approaches as we've seen throughout this tournament from right across the board. It's you know it's it's a very advanced game and a very fluid game. The amount of players that are playing different positions, so. It wasn't easy. Um, I think there's five Spain or four Spain players I've picked. So that probably gives a, a, an idea of the, the two teams that were stronger. I think Spain, England, Japan make up the vast majority of the team, um, which, yeah, they're, they're, up until the, the semi-finals, I thought Japan were the most impressive side I'd seen. So perhaps that was a little bit of recency bias maybe on, on my part. Um, and also I've got obviously Atiana Bob. Bo- Matty in the in the side after winning the golden ball, which I don't think I mean it'd be difficult to to disagree with after after her performances over the last few weeks. I, I'd like to think she's a definite for most, uh, and also Teresa Albajera from uh, Spain in midfield because I thought yesterday she, for all the talk of Bon Matty Puteas, you know, well, there's so many talented players Spain have got now, but she she did an absolute number I thought on the England midfield, and and any time they tried to close her down, she just had the ability to to play around and play through the press, and and was crucial to the. The, the Spain got the winning goal, goal that won the World Cup. So uh, yeah, that it's. Uh, but yeah, it's available to read for everyone to to tell me why I'm why I'm wrong and pick your own team. <laughs> I don't think we can um, disagree too much from what you said so far. So um, I might pick it out a little bit later and then rib you for it. <laughs> um, Hannah on Spain's performance, um, as we said earlier, it's probably one of their best performances of the entire tournament. They they really went out there and they really did it and. You know, it was it was absolutely amazing to see because we they have had so many off pitch problems. You know, they had so many players missing. And how do you think they're going to feel now missing out on that? Obviously, they've they have stood their moral ground, and I think that's a really admirable thing to do. And I think we actually have to say that in. You know, there's no, I don't think there is a right and wrong. There's players that did go out there and play for their country. They've done that as a personal choice. There are other players that haven't done that. But how do you think those players back at home in Spain are feeling? And how do you think also the players on the pitch were feeling, I guess, as well? Because there were some scenes post-match that weren't brilliant to see that are coming out this morning that people are noticing. Um, and some of the behaviours of, of some of the people. But talk us through exactly what Spain have done for their country. Yeah, I mean, pretty much all of yesterday, like the only thing really that I could think about was the players that that weren't there, that, that should have been there. When you think, you know, Patri is one of the best midfielders in, in, in the world and she's been outstanding for Barcelona. And Mappy Leon as well is another one that, you know, Spain are playing in a World Cup final and, and they're playing in a preseason friendly for Barcelona like that that just shouldn't be that shouldn't be a thing you you want the best players in the world on the biggest stage um the whole thing around Spain was you know even now I'm, I'm still a little bit confused and sort of you know not entirely sure what what's quite going on there obviously the whole thing with George Wilder especially I I, 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 I don't know like I, I don't really have the words to sort of explain it when it is such I think just a a tricky situation um and I guess only really the players involved in it really know what's going on what what has gone on and and things like that but it's hard to see George Wilder losing his job now if if, in that respect I I think if if he was pretty much set in his position before that he, he wasn't going anywhere um that's even stronger now you know so I can't really see the Spanish Federation getting rid of him anytime soon. I think if he ever does leave, it will probably be on his own accord. I, I don't really think that the players will, will be able to force him out in any way in the future if if that's sort of ever the route that they, they go down again. So 
it's it's a difficult one uh, I think for now uh, you can only really say you know the Spanish players deserve to just celebrate the achievement that they've had and you know I think when the dust settles I think maybe the position of everyone and, and sort of what the future means for them will become a lot clearer um I have no doubt about that but um for for the present moment you know they, they've just won a world cup you know regardless of what's gone on off the pitch that is quite literally the the biggest achievement that you can ever have <laughs> in your entire career um so at the moment that's it's probably not at the forefront of their mind it's just about enjoying the moment and and sort of reveling in in this incredible ach- achievement that they've had and the fact that they have done it despite everything that that has gone on sort of leading up to the world cup and and the beginning of the tournament as well and that heavy defeat to japan like the fact that they've gone on and still achieved that it's scary to think what spain could be (laughs) if everything was was rosy and you know the all their players were sort of on the same wavelength and, and all sort of fighting for the same sort of cause and stuff like that so um the fact that they've won a World Cup in spite of everything is incredible. So uh, the, the scary thing is to say, are we going to be entering a sort of period of Spain dominance that, that we've seen with the US over the years? You know, Spain are the best team in the world and it's hard to see, you know, anyone knocking them off their perch now, um, especially if, you know, the Federation gets their act together off the pitch even more so. So, um, yeah, it's be interesting to see you know it'll be a lot more telling over the coming months what happens but just from reading like everything about it it just seems like such a complex crazy sort of situation um so I guess only time will tell but for now it's just probably about appreciating the the achievement really I think that's it and it is important to say that despite everything we have to appreciate we talk so much about the legacy that Lionesses have left behind and the legacy that they're continuing to carry through into the following weeks and months and years. But what this is going to do for the rest of the nations, for the rest of the federations, for the rest of the, the boys and the girls and the adults and the men and the women and absolutely everybody on this planet that enjoys football, this, is, this World Cup has really set the standard for for the next one and and Beth obviously have got the Olympics next year have got the Euros then following and then it it will be time for a World Cup again soon um how do you see because obviously like Hannah said there the USA are Spain that that next that next legacy coming in that that next kind of dominance in in women's football on the international stage um where do you kind of see the USA going now um, and, and how things will will envelope that? Yeah, I think it, the USA is, is a really tricky one because, you know, they have a real crop of exciting young talent. You know, we spoke about it a lot ahead of this tournament, the likes of Sophia Smith, Trinity Rodman players who are nowhere near at the peak of the powers yet. And I think that's a really exciting prospect for USA fans if they can get the right manager in. Hopefully that won't be Serena Wiegmann. I know sort of Mark Bullingham and Serena herself have been quite firm in, in the stance that, you know, she's not going anywhere until at least 2025 this week, which is reassuring. But yeah, it will be interesting to see where the USA go next. But for Spain, it is a really exciting time. I mean, they've won the, the under-17 World Cup, the under-20 World Cup as well. So you just have to think, gosh, there's such a a vast array of talent and a production line of talent that could see them sorted for for years to come. But I think sort of just weighing in on that situation a little bit, obviously, as Hannah said, we don't know the full details. You hear sort of whisperings of of things that have gone on, but, it, it you know, the players haven't come out and explicitly really spoken about the, the full details of that situation with the Federation and, and Jorge Bill. So, you know, we have to be careful with, with how we discuss it. But I think for me, just sort of considering it's been such a... An, a and a brilliant tournament for, for the women's game as a whole and and you know so many success stories and and great to see so many nations coming through I just thought it was a little bit of a left a little bit of a sour taste in the mouth yesterday um certainly in terms of the the situation with with Jenny Hermoso and and the FA president um Luis Rublos after after the game obviously I'm not sure if, if people saw but um when they were doing the medal presentation he 
kissed her on the lips in you know in full view of the tv cameras in full view of um of everything and, and, and everyone um, and you know she came out after the game and, and said on an on an instagram but on an instagram live she said you know I, I didn't like it um which obviously suggests that you know it was there was a slight element of discomfort there and then the fa have come out spanish fa have circulated a statement on her behalf by the way and um, where she has apparently said you know it was totally mutual it you know it didn't mean anything and i think the fact that you know, we've ended this brilliant tournament, this brilliant festival of women's football with a group of men making a statement on behalf of a woman. Um, I think that probably speaks volumes about where the game still has to improve. And, you know, I think Spain are, are caught up in that at the moment. Obviously, it's difficult to see how that's going to change with, with Jorge Vilda. You know, he's obviously, from a footballing point of view, has achieved something remarkable. Um, and it will be interesting to see how that unfolds. But, yeah, that made me slightly uncomfortable with, with the way that whole situation played out with Spain and I think um you know I think that that will be interesting to see how that works but I guess to, to end on a positive I think you know as a whole the tournament has been it's exceeded expectations hasn't it It really has and there's been so many sort of success stories so many nations that you know we didn't expect would go and, and really do anything at this tournament and pulling off these incredible victories and these incredible feats and hopefully for for nations, you know, in, in South America, in Africa, where the, the federations have perhaps neglected women's football for, for a little while, um, the performances of, of some of, of those nations at this tournament will help to, to completely redefine the women's game in their countries. And and hopefully in, in 2027, the, the, the tournament will be bigger and, and better than ever. I think that's one of the best ways that we can, we can possibly end that. There has been so many moments in this world cup that have just contributed to the most historic women's world cup that i think that we've ever seen there have been so many history makers we've seen the first hijab worn in the world cup as well since those rules were relaxed that people could wear them um we have had so many record-breaking attendances um jack you've been there for some of them and I'm guessing it has been absolutely wild to be there. These nations have put in absolutely everything. And I don't think that we can take anything away from the fact that now we have got such an exciting period coming up for women's football across the entire world. You know, these women have done everything to put their nations, their federations, their, their, their own domestic leagues on the world stage because don't forget these these women still play for leagues across the entire world back home we do have the barclays women's championship starting this weekend coming up and i think it's a testament to actually start that off by one of the first fixtures is going to be blackburn against birmingham city and birmingham already play their games at st andrews but this time blackwood Blackburn are at home, but they're going to be playing at Ewood Park. And I think that's a testament to see the championship clubs now starting to take note of the Arsenals and the Chelsea's playing at the Emirates and and Stamford Bridge. And I think now we're in a time where we can see so much growth and hopefully it will be a walk while you run situation and nobody gets too carried away. Um but thank you all so much for joining us. You will be able to continue looking at our coverage for the upcoming season across all of our REACH titles. Um, Jack, thank you so much for joining us in the dark, as always in Sydney. Um, <laughs> we hope I'll you a, have... I'll have a better backdrop for when I'm back <laughs> in the UK. Next time. We'll get you a green screen so it's just the opera house behind you. <laughs> um thank you all to everybody who's been a part of this as well um here's hoping that women's football is continuing to be on the up and that everybody will continue to support every all of the leagues and the growth of women's football